Hello again, Adam here. If you like the content I'm putting up, please like, comment, and subscribe. All right, let's begin. Native Americans had a long history of militarily resisting Europeans. This began almost immediately after encountering them. In our last video, we discussed the first slave revolt by Africans in the Americas. But in this video, we will recount THE first slave revolt period. And it was by the first enslaved peoples of the Americas, the Taino natives of Hispaniola. While Africans did join the rebels, it was primarily led by the native Indians. The slave revolt, led by the Taino cacique, or chief, Enriquillo, is an example of what I would argue a successful nonviolent resistance. I say that because it wasn't technically nonviolent, as we'll see. His successful response to extreme oppression and a superior enemy force is interesting, and we can draw some lessons from it. Another important feature of this story is the strategies that the Spanish colonists employed to deal with this revolt were repeated over and over with future revolts by African slaves. It's important to know some of the background for Enriquillo. There are legends about what happened to Enriquillo's father, the most prominent among the chiefs of Hispaniola, but nothing is entirely clear. What's known for sure is that in 1503, Governor de Obando killed his father and most of the Taino chiefs, decapitating the leadership in one stroke. Enriquillo was orphaned and taken in to be educated by Franciscan monks who raised him as a Catholic. He was well-liked and respected by his master and the Franciscan monks. His early life was marked by cooperation and cordial relations with the Spanish who raised him. But when his master died and he was succeeded by his son, Enriquillo was disrespected and abused. Enriquillo owned a horse which was a rare possession by a Taino and shows how favored he was by the Spanish. This was stolen from him and his master violated his marriage. When he protested, he was beaten. He appealed to the lieutenant governor, and when he did, he was threatened with violence and imprisoned by him. He then went all the way to Santo Domingo, seeking justice, and got a favorable ruling from the court. When he brought it back to the lieutenant governor, he was beaten again and even more severely. The sympathetic Dominican priest, Bartolome de las Casas, writes, quote, He determined not to serve his enemy, nor to send any Indian of his, and therefore to defend himself in his country. This is what the Spaniards called and today call Enrique's rising up and becoming a rebel. But if one were to speak truthfully, it is nothing more than fleeing from his cruel enemies. Unquote. Due to disease, mistreatment, and famine, the Taino, which had once numbered several hundred thousand, had been reduced to no more than 20,000 at the time of Enriquillo. This type of injustice and abuse was experienced by the rest of the population, making the Taino ripe for revolt. In 1519, Enriquillo fled Spanish control with about 50 men. A patrol of 12 men was organized to hunt them down and return them, but the rebels successfully defended themselves, killing the captain and eight others. Thereafter, the rebels avoided the Spanish except for occasional raids to acquire supplies. Meanwhile, their numbers grew from 50 men to hundreds of fugitive Africans and Indian slaves, forming a large and independent community. A second larger force of 70 men was dispatched to end the revolt, and they too were routed. These successes swelled the ranks of the rebels and have interesting implications. How were the Taino able to defeat Spanish cavalry? Horses weren't native to Hispaniola, so even though the Taino could fight, they did not know how to fight against men on horses. It's not crazy to speculate that Muslim Wolof slaves with military experience could have been a major factor in defeating the second larger force of 70 Spaniards. Indians would often flee before cavalry charges. The Wolof may have taught them to split their formation and let the cavalry pass before turning around and closing ranks again. It's likely that they trained Enriquillo's forces on these tactics to allow them to successfully rout the Spaniards. This is the same tactic the Wolof used when they held their ground in their 1522 revolt. After they defeated the Spanish force, they relocated to the mountains where they were able to elude the authorities easily and even cultivated crops. The fact that they could survive independently and attract more and more fugitives represented an existential threat to the colonists. One Spaniard complained, quote, that the rebels know the land, and so they mock the Spaniards, unquote. The costs of hunting the rebels were substantial, and the colonists resisted paying taxes to support the patrols. Nevertheless, they were able to eventually support 300 armed men, 
to hunt for Enriquillo for three years. This was extremely costly and failed miserably. Regardless, the successes of Enriquillo inspired others to become fugitives and join him or to organize their own rebel bands. He was also able to use his people's knowledge of the land as well as his familiarity with the Spaniards to defend his people. A captain hunting him wrote, quote, In truth, this war is not like what occurred in the past on this island, nor of the character of those of New Spain and Cuba and other parts, because here it is a war with Indians educated and raised among us, and they know our forces and customs and further use armor and have swords and lances, unquote. Again, it seems that Africans may have helped train the Taino on the use of these foreign weapons. The discipline required to survive and avoid detection was impressive. No fires were allowed. Chickens had their tongues cut out so they could not crow. Encampments were also spread out as much as 30 miles from one another. Loud farm animals were raised by no more than two or three people in remote areas away from the encampments. Enriquillo avoided violent conflict whenever possible and forbade his people from killing Spaniards unless absolutely necessary, and only in defense. In this way, I considered the rebellion quote-unquote non-violent. The Spaniards, unable to suppress the rebels by force, sent out priests familiar with Enriquillo to make contact for negotiations. He eventually agreed to talks in 1528, but the agreements fell apart because he didn't trust them. Five years later, in 1532, negotiations resumed and Enriquillo finally accepted terms. It's important to note that in a previous video, we discussed the Wolof Muslim slave revolt of 1522 to 1523 and the subsequent major slave revolts of 1523 in Mexico, 1527 in Puerto Rico, and 1529 in Cuba. The costly failed military ventures, the fear and paranoia of deadly slave revolts, and labor shortages forced the Spanish to change their tactics. As a last resort, they offered negotiations. The agreement, also called the Capitulaciones, was that the rebels would be protected under the Spanish crown to be free and settle where they wanted and to be given cattle and tools. However, they would have to agree to surrender any fugitive slaves that would join them in the future. In this way, the Spanish were able to pacify the revolt and establish the rebels as a mechanism to strengthen their control of the island. Enriquillo died just three years later in 1535. He won a historic peace between his people and the Spanish. Enriquillo negotiated as an unconquered Taino, an equal partner, and guaranteed the freedom, safety, and security of his people. The Spanish response to this rebellion was the model that would be replicated with all the future slave revolts on Hispaniola, which would all be led by Africans. First, the Spanish would attempt to crush them militarily. If that didn't work, then they tried to use captured rebels to betray their comrades. Next, they would have missionaries try and convince them to surrender. Only as a last resort would they offer the capitulaciones. This rebellion proves an interesting model for extracting concessions from a powerful oppressor. Nonviolence, or at least purely defensive combat, avoided inflaming the Spaniards with a desire for vengeance. It also allowed the rebels to survive by not directly engaging a superior military force. At the same time, the discipline and unity of the rebels allowed them to directly threaten the economy and social order of the colonists. This sustained pressure is what gave them leverage over the Spanish. They did not overthrow the status quo in a revolution, but they were able to win their freedom with honor and negotiate a peace as equal partners. Some interpret the concession to return fugitive slaves as a stain on the reputation of Enriquillo for being a freedom fighter and a champion against slavery. You can make up your own mind about this, but in my opinion, it was a pragmatic move. His people could not survive forever in the mountains, and the Spaniards had already received reinforcements from Spain. Furthermore, there were many fugitive slaves that formed their own independent bands and communities. Escaped slaves didn't need to join Enriquillo's community. Eventually, there were enough rebel settlements that were offered capitulaciones that fugitive slaves could easily disappear into the largest communities. Another interesting development is that this revolt is the first successful collaboration with Native Americans and Africans. The Africans could offer training in warfare and experienced warriors, while the Taino knew the land and its agriculture. 
the Taino never again led a revolt because of their diminished numbers, but in future revolts, they certainly joined with their fellow enslaved Africans. It's inspiring that even in the midst of the horror of chattel slavery and colonialism that the human desire for freedom and justice can prevail at least some of the time. If you like the content I'm putting up, please like, comment, and subscribe, and thank you for watching.